Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webcast, How Adding Layers of Perimeter Defense Can Render Attacks Useless. My name is Maureen McCormick, Vice President of Marketing at Komodo Cybersecurity, and I'll be your host for today's session. We have just a few housekeeping updates before I introduce today's speakers. First of all, we'll be recording today's session, and it will be available on demand um, at the Komodo's uh, Bright Talk channel. At any time during the presentation, you can enter a question into the queue. We should have time at the end of today's presentation to take your questions live. And there's also attachments available for you to download, so feel free to do that before we get started or at the end of today's session. At this time, I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Rob Ayub is a program director in IDC's Security Products Program. In this role, he provides thought leadership and guidance for clients on a wide range of security products ranging from traditional network security products such as firewall, IPS, and UTM. Rob is also responsible for research and analysis around a wide range of evolving security market markets, including forensics and security and vulnerability management. Welcome today, Rob. Gus Evangelicos is the Director of Sales Engineering at Komodo Cybersecurity. Gus has worked with many large organizations helping implement security and best practices. His experience spans across the different security techniques, including isolation, machine learning, UBA, and more. Thanks very much for your time today, Gus. With that, I'll pass things over to Rob to begin today's session. Great. Thank you, Maureen. So for today, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about investing beyond the firewall. It should come as no surprise to anybody on this call that we are moving into a hybrid world. And as a result, our thinking about protecting this new hybrid world has to evolve. While firewalls are still a critical component of our security architecture, all organizations, no matter the size, need to consider the other attack vectors that have become prevalent and think about how they're going to protect their new hybrid infrastructures in a cloud-based world. And we as security professionals, hey, we're, we're good at perimeter defense, but we sure need to get a lot better at protecting the new reality that we live in every single day. So I'd like to start with a little bit of humor. And this is an oldie, but a goodie from Dilbert. It expresses something that I think any security professional can relate, can relate to, the blame resting on the firewall. And even though we might still get a chuckle out of this strip today, it's actually getting a little dated. Does the firewall guy really get the blame today? Or is it just the security guy? Is it all about the firewall? Or is it about things like phishing emails and, and, and malware and, and things taking over our endpoints? Maybe in the future of this strip, we'll just talk about the security guy because we are quickly moving away from a firewall-centric approach to security. And we need to be comfortable with that as security professionals today. And that, that's what I'm going to really discuss today as we think about how to evolve our security architectures beyond just being firewall. So a couple of points I wanted to touch on today. I'm going to talk a little bit very quickly about how we got here. You know, I think it's very easy to just sort of think, yeah, yeah, we, we're in a cloud-based world. But how we got here is, is important. And, and continues to influence how we think about security today. I'm then going to talk a little bit about some of the choices, and there are many, that we have today as we look to provide security to our organization beyond the firewall. I'm then going to talk a little bit about creating an effective layered defense strategy, because it requires a different sort of thinking than, than we maybe have thought of in the past. And finally, I'm going to provide a little guidance for the future. Uh, you know, based on our many inquiries with customers that, are, that cover a wide range of maturity, I'm going to talk about some of the best practices I've seen and some of the things that organizations are starting to think about today as they look to secure themselves against the, you know, the, the wide range of attacks that we're seeing um, that are very effective today. So how did we get here? In the beginning, of course, there was physical security. And the main thing that we worried about in a mainframe world was physical protection, 
access control was key. We had no remote connectivity, a limited number of users, and one system. And, you know, I guess now we look back and we think of it as the, the simple, simpler times. Uh, you know, I don't know if any of you have read uh, Cuckoo's Egg by Cliff Stoll, but things like access control was key. Getting to the system, accounting was key. That's the things we worried about. And unfortunately, sometimes I, I, I feel like we still put a lot of emphasis on some of the things that, that sure, they're important, but really aren't as effective at securing the system as we, we sort of have been brought up to believe. So after, after that, that the sort of physical security world, we became client server. And in many ways, I think we still think in terms of a client server environment. We still live in this client server world. I talk to organizations all the time that still have a network team and an endpoint team under their, their security team. And while this era was great for security products, some of the challenges the industry faces today was, it was really driven by the, this client-server thinking. And as I mentioned, I think today we, we still get hung up on, on thinking this way. We think about clients and servers or network and endpoint or, um, you know, and, and this may not really be the most effective way to look at our security architectures today. And we're going to talk about that throughout the presentation. So where, where are we today? Today, we are in what IDC calls the third platform, scalable on-demand infrastructures, digital transformation, and things like mobile, big data, social, and cloud. And it, it really requires a whole new way to think about security. And in fact, when we think about the third platform effects on security, these are, are some of the most common uh, areas and challenges that we see uh, that we we see changing um, for professionals today. We see, you know, we continue to see a growing number of environments and devices to protect. Today, if you think about your own environment, you know, how many how many environments do, are you really protecting today? If you have a, a private data center running on on say VMware, you have Office 365 and hosted Exchange plus your traditional window environment, and what if you have developers running uh, Mac OS, there's a huge number of environments to, to protect today. We are dealing, of course, with the death of a perimeter. There is no perimeter today. Employees work wherever they need to work. They're, if they're on the road, coffee shops, home offices, you know, these things have all, uh, there, there's no solid perimeter as we used to know it. The attackers have gotten better. You know, their cyber attacks today are extremely sophisticated. We continue to see a proliferation of security tool sets. It's easier than ever for somebody to go on and, and, and download some very advanced tools that can, that can do very advanced attacks very quickly. And worst of all is the scarcity of qualified information security professionals. It's no surprise, and everyone knows, that we are, we are, are massively under-supported in the industry. There just are not enough experienced professionals to do the job that we need to do. So how do we how do we deal with this changing world? And for so for security professionals, you have more choices than ever before, not just in products and vendors, but in deliveries and environments and platforms. And while it's great to have lots of choices, you know, I, I think about you know going going to get the ice cream at the store. Hey, do I? It's not just about chocolate and vanilla, but you know everything in between and Rocky Road and pecan cluster and all those other things. But with all those choices. You know, sometimes we run into what I call analysis paralysis. I get a lot of inquiry calls with customers where they just they get so hung up on on looking at the platforms and the options, they just don't. They end up not making a choice, and we we know that that that's just opening um, opening themselves up to attack. I believe that organizations need some guidance in how they think about security today in order to understand and ultimately make the appropriate choices for their organizations. I'm going to talk about a few things that we encourage organizations to think about as they, they look at their environments and come to grips with protecting a hybrid, uh, hybrid world. So one of the biggest challenges for organizations to make as they move into hybrid 
is the need to rely on some level of automation of security. The scale of the problem and the scale of the infrastructure means that we simply cannot do security the same way we always have. I mean, just think about even the traditional managing firewall rules. When we start adding on AWS and private cloud and, and Azure, you know, just creating security groups, policies, and rules is extremely challenging. It's just not something we can do manually. The same goes for other sorts of attacks and, and processing things like like, you know, in, in, uh, protecting against phishing attacks and ransomware. The attacks are changing so quick, we have to start relying on some level of automation. This is an uncomfortable position for a lot of security professionals that have grown up in a, in a world where automation was bad. But the truth of the matter is, today, the scale of the problem has, needs to change our perspective. We need to start thinking about things like automation in order to, uh, to tackle the challenges that we're faced with today. This should provide a good visual as to the challenges we have with protecting our environments today. When you think about your own data center, its applications, the cloud applications like Salesforce, the devices on it, manually protecting each and every vector is nearly impossible. And you're not gonna do it with a single device. You're gonna need multiple, pro multiple approaches. And some of those approaches need to, need to reside in the cloud or, or in another hosted environment. That's the only way we're gonna, we're gonna solve the security challenges we're faced with today. Part of what I think is deceiving a lot of professionals today is that we are still dealing with many of the same threats we have been dealing with for years. This survey was done last summer and, and I think really illustrates you know, the, the challenge that that we have today, that phishing, ransomware, spyware are still ranked as the top threats to an organization. And yet, we've been dealing with all those issues for a long, long time. But the challenge is that today, there's so many new vectors for these attacks that our traditional defenses are simply not holding up. Even I received a phishing email the other day that was extremely convincing didn't just leverage a bad link, and it didn't have bad language, but it was very well written, graphically correct, and linked to another web service. The only clue was buried deep in a link and required looking at the source code. Our defenses struggle to catch these kinds of modern forgery, and that's why when we talk to customers, they, they, they cite these you know, phishing and ransom, ransomware as their, their top attacks. But you can't just protect that the way you used to. It, it's not about stopping things you know, in a firewall. It requires a multi-vector approach. What's even worse is that the cloud in some, way, in some ways has snuck up on security professionals. This slide shows data from a survey that we ran last fall. And there are a couple of key takeaways here. If you look, the top three attacks are still no surprise. But the fact that 79, 74, and 68% of respondents respectively indicated that, these t that each of these attack vectors in some way leveraged the cloud. An additional question from the same survey asked about time spent dealing with the cloud. And this one was actually a little surprising to me that over 50% of respondents indicated that today they're spending more time on cloud services than they do on premise. So that means that, that if you're a security professional, you're spending more of your time in your cloud, more attacks are leveraging in the cloud, and we typically still think of our on-premise defenses as the key way to protect against modern threats. We have to shift our thinking a little bit. When considering security buying today, there's lots of options. These three here listed here are the most common options for organizations today, and we recommend that organizations look at their architecture and think about the implications of each one of these, of these um, delivery methods. There's usually gaps and shortcomings in each approach, and understanding how one can augment another is very helpful for organizations that might be struggling to make a choice. 
you know, do you do you want your are you going to rely on on your cloud infrastructure provides the security? Are you going to purchase a hosted service? You know, a couple of years ago, SaaS security and, and hosted security was considered something that you know was very limited. It, it, it had performance challenges. But today, there's a number of very very good hosted solutions, and then even managed security service providers are a great option to help help cover the gaps for a lot of organizations. I think the key point is that you don't have to go it alone. You can rely on on other providers to help you as you work to protect the cloud and your your infrastructure today. One of the other things that we advise customers consistently is that there are no silver bullets. And I like to use a car analogy, the car buying analogy. Um, organization still have to think about, do I want to buy a product and, and have it on premise? Am I going to lease a product, which is similar to a SaaS or security as a service? Or am I going to go with the Uber model or completely hosted? Each of these has, has, of course, challenges. And every organization needs to think about all these things separately and the, the pros and cons. But you know, more and more, we're we're finding a move towards the, this sort of SaaS or hosted models, and a lot of organizations have found that they're okay with with taking what a vendor delivers, and that there might be some usage limits. But for a lot of organizations, the vendor can do a lot of things better than than they can, especially in a hosted model where they can leverage constant updates and, and continual delivery of the the most current security protections. So it's, th there's a lot to think about, but more and more we're, f we're advising organizations to embrace and to look for their gaps and don't be so afraid of moving to, say, a host or provider to, to protect against things that, that maybe they, they just don't have the expertise to cover internally. The truth of the matter is securing the cloud to, is, is here and it's going to continue to grow. These metrics are from a, a survey that we, we ran last fall as well. And the, you know, it's asking organizations to look one year, two year, and three years out. And the most telling metric that come, came out of the survey is the fact that, that most organizations are moving from mostly on-premise to either 50-50, mostly cloud, or 100% or cloud. And that trend, we don't see that trend stopping. And as, 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 that, as the security teams move more into the cloud, it's important for organizations to understand both what their options are and to understand what's available because the offerings themselves continue to get better and better. And we see the ability for organizations to cover the multiple vectors they have to deal with um, becoming much easier than it ever was before. So finally, to wrap up, uh, before I turn it over to Gus, you know, just, just some final guidance from, uh, that we've been giving a lot of our customers, and I encourage all listeners to, to consider, is that first and foremost, security is no longer just network or just endpoint. It must be holistic. You have to look at all the all the SaaS platforms you're supporting today. What are your users using? And instead of just saying no or trying to control it, look to provide security on those platforms. It's important to look at all the connections inside and outside the organization. You know, again, this has to do with where's your data going? Do you have folks using Box or Dropbox, Salesforce? Um, how are you managing the security on those platforms? You have to evaluate solutions that provide visibility across all the delivery vectors. You know, one of the biggest challenges I think for organizations today is they simply don't have visibility across all their vectors and all the all the connections that they're and all the, the, the SaaS applications their users are using. Visibility is key and the solutions out there are getting better and better at providing that visibility. Finally, I encourage all organizations I talk to, to evaluate the vendors that allow you to follow the data from, from all the way through the process, from an endpoint to data center, all the way to, to a SaaS provider or the cloud and back. And 
the, the vendors that can really and truly provide you that end-to-end -end coverage are going to provide you the most value to your organization. So hopefully this was helpful to you, and now I'm going to turn it over to Gus. Thanks a lot, Rob. That was a great presentation. Um, so, Rob, you definitely touched on a lot of points that we are also hearing uh, from our customers here at Komodo. Um, and I just want to give everyone a background of who Komodo is before we jump right into uh, today's topics. Um, so Komodo Cybersecurity has been around for 20 years um, in the industry. Um, you know, we've been uh, growing our team, and we have a 24-7 global security operations team uh, constantly looking out for different threats from all different vectors uh, to help um, you know, deliver that data to all the products that we are helping uh, protect our customers. We're also a 1,200 employee uh, company globally with many in engineering um, to help you know, address the issues and the requests customers have from a security perspective and being able to um, deliver them as quickly as possible. And the other part is that we have about 86 million endpoints around the world uh, reporting to us millions of unknown files and basically with our auto containment technology we'll discuss in a little bit, we're able to verdict a lot of malware um, from all around the world. We're present in about 140 different countries with our endpoint solution, which helps us helps deliver a lot of threat intelligence. Now, um, to Rob's point, uh, being you know having a solution that's holistic and trying to understand from the endpoint, from the network, um, and all aspects of your infrastructure and how to best get that data and protect it, uh, Komodo does offer a very large platform for securing our customers, whether it be uh, on the network side, on the endpoint, um, you know, anti-spam, and Secure Web Gateway, which is our main topics. Essentially, we can deliver that holistic view that Rob mentioned, um, and for you to be able to trace, you know, when you have events on the endpoint, um, or maybe it's a URL click or, or, or a phishing email, you can track that within all one management platform, which is called our C1 platform. Now, today's topic is specifically for anti-spam and secure web gateway. Um, and the reason, you know, we want to have this conversation is because we are, you know, as Rob mentioned, living in the cloud uh, era, and essentially we, there's no borders anymore where that firewall is helping protect, um, you know, your users, especially when they're leaving your organization, okay? If they're beyond that firewall, they can go and check a lot of other, um, you know, personal uh, email, personal uh, SaaS services, or you know, even social media platforms where essentially you need to still be able to have some visibility and control. Okay, now a few statistics regarding the email and web threats. Um, the one thing that we have definitely seen even from recent reports from Verizon and others is that email is still the most common web threat. And a lot of email um, doesn't necessarily always come with a payload but it also results in web clicks, right? You might try to get fish to click to a website or have a watering hole type of an attack. And so when we do see some of these statistics, it's pretty frightening um, that, you know, essentially not having these kind of protections um, in this current age of the threat landscape uh, to help, you know, protect the users when they go home or if they're behind the office, essentially you want to make sure that, you know, you don't want to, you want to prevent as much as possible from these threats. And considering email is the number one threat vector of, um, you know, malware coming through, and also um, if you look at the statistic, which is one in 13 web requests lead to malware, we need a better way to help uh, protect against these attacks. And the one thing that we can make uh, certain is that year over year, uh, we have seen an increase for every attack, um, specifically malware infections, compromised accounts, and loss of data. And again, it's because of those phishing, spear phishing, um, or whaling attacks that you have. The other thing is that you'll see some specific uh, crime organizations that might be idle for a certain period of time, um, specifically the Emotet, Trojan, and Bot Network. And that's because sometimes when you, know, when you have hackers and groups where their code um, is able to be detected and their probability of you know, attacking an organization with what they already have uh, becomes less, essentially they might take time to re- develop their code, make their armor, I'm sorry, their attack a lot better. Um, and what we've seen here is an increase in Emotet, Trojan, and Botnet activity, which is a 2,000% increase. 
And it's essentially getting through um, to customers where we have financial data and other records being siphoned out of uh, user systems. The other thing that we have seen is a 92% increase in new downloader variants. What that means is in most cases now, um, we don't have a lot of emails or uh, specifically you know, executables that are actually packing the payload or the malicious payload with it. It might be an innocent uh, software program with a you know, slight code in, the, uh, in it to be able to download that payload after it's been installed or executed in our system, bypassing a lot of the latest next-gen machine learning vendors out there that are doing static analysis or other type of um, you know, detection with features. And essentially, um, by having this increase in downloaders, um, the attackers are able to get that you know, small portable executable through uh, via download or via script coming in through an email and essentially the attack happens afterwards, after that executable has been installed. Uh, the other part is we've seen a 62% increase in overall botnet activity identified at the gateway, meaning there's most likely some system in your organization that's communicating out to a, a command and control server. And having visibility and the ability to block those types of communications is very key um, to make sure that you know, there's no data exfiltration, et cetera. So um, what we really hear from customers is how can they control, monitor, and protect? They want to understand how they can you know, do this in their environment, especially when you have such vast um, you know, organizations where they have mobile users, they have different platforms, they might have uh, different applications that everyone uses, and it's not easy to have a, you know, a clear understanding of what everyone's accessing. Um, you know, and how you can protect the data and your users beyond the office, making sure that your data doesn't leave your asset when your user goes home. Um, how to protect against zero-day malware before it even reaches the endpoint. Right? You want to use that defense in depth um, you know, to help mitigate as much as possible. Um, they also want to prevent data and intellectual property from being emailed out of the company um, or even uploaded to you know, SaaS services or personal um, sharing services. And they'll also combat the phishing and whaling campaigns, which have been on the rise. And lastly, we want to also prevent users from visiting malicious URLs and risky categories. Um, you know, they want to be able to control where their users are able to visit. Right? A lot of social engineering, a lot of social attacks are coming in through social networks. And being able to prevent that on your assets where you know, your data is sitting on, um, you want to make sure that user is not going to potentially dangerous um, categories when they're you know out of the office or they're not really working and potentially could be under attack so we have a lot of solutions out there that help mitigate a lot of these use cases you know as Rob mentioned um, there's different um, things out there such as firewalls there's already built-in um, anti spams you have VPN to try and mitigate you know um, company data from being accessed outside the network um, you also have DLP solutions, intrusion detection systems. But the one thing that we're still seeing is that users are still being infected. Even with these latest capabilities, uh, we're still seeing you know, malicious uh, emails coming through. We have the you know, scripts, uh, could be a whaling attack, a watering hole attack. Um, and essentially, the users are still able, uh, downloading. Um, maybe they don't even know what they're you know, clicking on. And essentially, you, they have those payloads, they have those executables, they have those PowerShell scripts that come through and essentially reach out to some command control server. And we're seeing that these things are still happening, even with a lot of these protections in place. So how can we help combat some of this? Um, now, what we've done at Komodo Cybersecurity is we've created what we call auto containment. And we use that across a lot of our products to help customers mitigate that zero day risk. Um, when a file is not known or if there's a detection capability that hasn't been seen before and hasn't been developed to detect specific threats. Now, with auto containment technology, we've integrated this into our um, anti-spam solution and our secure web gateway solution, which is the two products we're discussing here today. And essentially what we can do is identify um, from a cloud, uh, we can have either hosted or on-prem or in the cloud solutions, and see what the user's activity is. Now, in many cases, you might have files that are coming through, um, whether it be from an email, or maybe a user is downloading it, or maybe there's a bot that's essentially trying to download a payload. And that will be inspected by Komodo's anti-spam and secure web gateway products before it reaches a user. 
Now, during that time, you, that download will happen, and this file at that point is unknown. Now, what we do is we leverage our Valkyrie um, platform on the back end, which is essentially our threat intelligence um, service. And what we do is we ingest millions of files or you know, other information, which I'll show you in the next slide. And in this case, we do a cross-check to see if that file has ever been seen before across our entire um, you know, uh, deployment. So we have about 86 million endpoints that we mentioned before. And you have a lot of zero-day um, payloads or malware that essentially uh, executes around the world when they're first created. And it typically will land in one of our endpoints from auto container. And that will upload those files into Valkyrie so that if an attack happens somewhere around the world, customers in another part of the world will be protected instantly. Now, when we do this, that file will be down, um, again, will be checked with Valkyrie, which uses machine learning on the back end as well as human experts to actually classify those files when required and machines are not good enough at detecting. And if it's verdicted as malware, essentially that file will not be allowed to be given to the user. It will be uh, blocked at the gateway um, and it will never be delivered to the actual user or that endpoint. The other part is we want to make sure that if there's not a lot of false positives. We want to make sure that the users are still able to work and do their work. And by being able to ingest millions of files daily, we know a lot about good files as well. And so when we see a good file come in, the like same process happens, that it will check that file against Valkyrie, and if we have seen it before and it's marked safe, we will essentially allow that user to download that file and do their work. The problem comes when you have unknown files and it still has never been seen in the world. These are the custom payloads that you know hackers are um, expertly putting together, whether it's nation state attacks where you know their code is not uploaded to virus total and it's not sent to millions of people, it's targeted towards a specific organization. And it's you know it's a way to make sure that that code that they wrote is going to get bypassed through whatever layer that company potentially has. Now what we've done at Komodo with the auto containment technology is when that file is not actually um, able to be uh, detected as seen before, so it has never, there's no file hash, no, no one has ever seen this file in the world before, what we do is we will wrap it in a container on its way to the user. So in this case, we will wrap this into what we call portable containment. Our endpoint solution actually has that on the endpoint, um, our advanced endpoint protection that we offer. And when that file is delivered, it will still be able to be executed by that user but it will have a green border around it and it will be locked in containment, which means it will still be operational, it'll still be usable, the user can still interact with that file, but whatever harm it's trying to do, it will never leave that contained space. Now at that same time, Valkyrie will do a machine learning analysis on it, and about 95% of the time, the machine learning verdict that we give it will be, um, you know, be able to be completed within 45 seconds. So when that file is actually downloaded again, it will be either bad or good. Now, the other part is that machine learning don't, doesn't always have the answers because they don't always have context as to what that file is or where it came from or being able to build enough profile to make the right decision. And so 5% of the time when we see these files, um, we have a huge team of uh, security analysts that essentially are able to verdict and review these files for our customers with a four-hour SLA. And so every file that will ever be downloaded for a customer um, you know, it will either be known good or known bad, and for anything that's unknown, we will always provide a verdict. That way that could be a, um, you know, a trusted verdict for that specific file, and essentially it will not infect the system even when it's in an unknown state. Okay. So again, what this does, um, the auto containment does not rely on signatures, and therefore it can protect against zero-day threats um, to not infect the computer. So our AI Valkyrie um, platform ingests data from about 80 million different uh, data points. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can see the screen there, but essentially we have honeypots, we have um, you know things out there collecting phishing emails, we have a huge DNS service that we offer and help also protect our customers, and we can see a lot of queries and requests. And essentially, we collect all that data and process it, whether it be for our anti-spam, our secure web gateway, our antivirus, um, and pretty much help pollinate all 
are security solutions with this threat intelligence that our security uh, team ingests. Now, for the DOME anti-spam, uh, which is basically our anti-spam solution that includes the auto containment, which no one else in the industry does, um, what we can do here is provide customers the ability to have clean uh, inboxes for their users. Um, it leverages, as I mentioned before, the Valkyrie threat intelligence to make sure that those files that are malicious um, will be blocked. Uh, we also have a reputation network to make sure that only um, legitimate email servers are allowed to email users, and if there's any blacklisted servers, um, we will also make sure that email never gets through. Um, we also have spear phishing and whaling protection to make sure that you know there's no spoofing um, or any kind of a uh, social engineering attack trying to happen, and giving you very granular controls to essentially manage who can email your users, um, and you can also do other. Um, you know, advanced training to make sure that those spam emails are also kept out. In addition, we also have DLP data protection to help prevent any sensitive information from leaking from your environment. So even if someone does get potentially um, access to an email account uh, through your credentials, um, you can still prevent it with the anti-spam solution as acting as a uh, middle point between, you know, your user, your mail server, and the data that that uh, tries to leave the organization and still block that information from leaking. Now, this is fully also integratable with Office 365, um, and it could be either uh, hosted in the cloud for very easy management, um, you know, low um, operational costs, and also, you know, uh, reducing the amount of servers and infrastructure required. For the Secure Web Gateway product, um, this is completely in the cloud. That way your users have protection anywhere they go. If they're trying to access the internet, there is protection for them when they browse um, you know, on their laptops. It doesn't have to be you know, behind the firewall. You don't need to open any infrastructure ports um, when you have on-prem solutions. This will essentially uh, guide the traffic, everything through our own cloud, through the Secure Web Gateway, uh, specifically for your portal. And anything that the user does, whether it be you know, specific URLs that they're going to, you can actually create rules to block um, URLs, file downloads, um, you know, configure it any way you would like to make sure that your user is protected. On top of that, we have built-in automatic protections um, to block against known malware, bot networks, command and control servers, um, you know, even being able to decrypt traffic and making sure that even if payloads are delivered, through a um, encrypted um, communication, we will decrypt it and make sure that you know whatever's in that packet, um, you know we can recognize it. And if it's malicious code, we will again block it. Um, the other part is again uh, preventing data loss. Right? You want to make sure that when your users go home on your laptops, they're not trying to upload these files to OneDrive or Box or Dropbox. And essentially, we can integrate DLP within the Secure Web Gateway platform. Um, that way, you can create your own rules or use any of our uh, built-in customized rules for PCI, HIPAA, and other compliance, and make sure that that data is inspected um, and allowed to be uploaded prior to that user um, trying to you know, upload that data. If it contains any sensitive information or any keywords or any regexes that you custom build, um, essentially, we can block that information from going out. Okay, and that's, um, that's pretty much it for the presentation uh, regarding the anti-spam and secure web gateway solution. And um, thank you everyone for, uh, you know, <laughs> for paying, uh, for visiting us and, uh, you know, having more information here regarding our solutions. Um, you can visit us at cdome.komodo.com, um, and that's where we have product briefings, and you know, we can always help uh, with a proof of value to make sure that these solutions work in your infrastructure, that we can you meet your use cases that you would like, and the setup, as I mentioned, is fairly easy. That way, um, you, know, you can get up and running with a simple uh, email address and um, provisioning. All right, Great. I will hand it over back to Maureen. Thanks, Gus. Thanks, Rob. Great presentations today. 
we did get a few questions from our audience, so I'd like to uh, read through them at this time and, and serve them up to you guys to address. Um, let's see. Uh, first question, how does auto containment differ from next-gen machine learning and malware? Um, if I can take this one, essentially, when we think about um, you know, how we're protecting against zero days, um, you know, we had the AV signatures, which essentially only for help protect us when we knew something was bad and it was a signature that, you know, that confirmed that that file was indeed bad. Machine learning is just a better detection capability, and what it does is it extracts features um, from known threats or known files um, and tries to prevent future attacks by trying to analyze the code and trying to see if there's enough bad code in there for it to verdict something malware. Now, the, diff the problem there is that it's still a detection-based methodology, and just like we create um, you know, different protections and machines are trying to use more features, hackers are also using machine learning to help by to bypass machine learning nowadays um, by putting you know, potentially junk code in there or using other techniques and learning techniques where you know, machine learning can be bypassed. And so, yes, it has done a great, um, you know, great advancement in detecting more malware, but when you really have only one or two custom samples um, that, again, could be from pretty smart and nation state type of attacks, these samples are not broad enough to be able to detect them um, with machine learning if they've never been seen before. And so auto containment helps mitigate that problem because it doesn't rely on signatures, it doesn't rely on any known previous um, detectors, and any time the file is unknown, it will always be trapped and not allow uh, to cause any kind of malicious activity on the endpoint. And at the same time, it gives the person the usability, that way the user can still operate with that uh, file and not have a blocked um, activity. Okay, good. Um, second question to read off here, Gus, this is probably a good one for you as well. Can your proxy, I'm assuming a Komodo cybersecurity proxy, inspect data and prevent uploads to cloud-based storage? Yes, absolutely. So um, essentially what we can do there is decrypt the traffic and we can inspect it uh, using ICAP and you know, inspecting what kind of data is in those specific files, or if you want, you can even you know, block the entire mind type um, as well. And essentially, when it's trying to be uploaded, we'll inspect the traffic because everything will go through our proxy um, and block that upload before it gets you know, to that service that it's trying to get to um, based on the rules that customers create. Okay, great. There was another question from somebody who asked, will this uh, webinar be available on demand? I missed it. Yes, it will be on demand. It will be on the Komodo Cybersecurity Bright Talk channel. Um, okay, um, here's a question. How should I think about multi-cloud security? I have workloads on AWS and use Office 365. I, I mean, I can talk about this, and then Gus, I, it'd be great to hear how Komodo Serve views it. I mean, when we're we're getting a lot of inquiries on our end about these sort of things, you know, what everyone was real happy with AWS and things like security groups or just deploying what they had, and now now that they add things like Office 365, now we're you know now we're worried about multi-cloud, and um, you know, and and things don't work exactly the same in in Azure as they do in AWS from, from a programming standpoint. And, you know, the thing we advise customers is, you know, they still ha you still have to evaluate your defenses the same way you would have, you, would, you always would have in, in terms of threat vectors. And, you know, looking, what, what we're seeing more and more, especially when we move to multi-cloud, is you have to evaluate vendors that work across all the different clouds and SaaS providers. And you you know maybe maybe we can't just rely on a single cloud provider whether you know regardless of if it's Amazon or Microsoft and you, you, it's good to look across the you know all the vendors and, and understand what they can provide across the different environments. I mean, Gus, you want to talk specifically about what Komodo provides? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so with Office 365, that's definitely one of the um, you know 
basically a lot of customers come to us and integrate the anti-spam solution with Office 365 um, just because they don't feel confident enough with the filtering that's already going on there. Um, and essentially, when customers, you know, come to us, we help um, make sure that, you know, they create the rules, the training, um, and utilize all the threat and um, malware data that we have to essentially block those threats from coming into their mailboxes where, you know, a lot of that data is not publicly available and essentially it's only things that we have from what we're seeing from our endpoints. Um, now, again, we can do um, also with the Secure Web Gateway, uh, create custom profiles of who's allowed to access certain services, um, you know, making sure that the traffic is going through the proxy and inspecting anything else that you would like, even if they're going to different Amazon um, services and essentially just having some kind of a policy control of who can do what and also being able to inspect the traffic, uh, what could be downloaded, file types, and just making sure that they're able to do their work without compromising your security. Okay, great. Um, the Q&A chat um, is starting to get a little bit busy. Um, and it looks like we have a couple of questions that are similar. So Gus, this one is for you. How does Komodo's cybersecurity solutions compare to other anti-spam solutions? Is containment the main differentiator? Does it vary by competitor? What are your thoughts there? Great question. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, you know, there are other anti-spam solutions. Um, but the one thing that we leverage is, you know, the threat intelligence that we get from our auto containment deployment. And yes, the main differentiator here is the auto containment piece um, that when you know that file comes in as an email or through your secure web gateway, auto containment will be there to make sure that that file is wrapped and even if it bypasses your other security measures, um, essentially it will still be protected when it lands on that endpoint while we're doing the analysis on the back end. Because if you just do a sandbox type of approach where that file is sent to a sandbox, essentially it might still be delivered to that user while that verdict is trying to happen, and at that point you can still get infected, um, just as we've seen with other customers where they've had phishing attacks. And so being able to contain that file on its way to that user and wrapping it on its way down um, essentially will protect that endpoint and at the same time allow them to still execute that file. Okay, excellent. Um, we'll take a couple more questions here. Um, I have email security. Isn't that enough to protect against phishing and ransomware? Why is web protection also so important? So the main reason for that is when you think about how hackers are approaching um, email attacks and you know other ways to get to your user where essentially they're trying to entice them to click somewhere else, that's how they're going to get their attack coming in, right? A lot of the new emails um, that are getting through um, attack-wise, they're not carrying payloads or executables with them. They might be just simple VB scripts. There might be some JavaScript where it still might get through to that or even a simple web link. And when you click on that link, the protection that you're going to get is from your secure web gateway because that's already in that user's mailbox. It's already sitting there, and they're able to click on that link. Once they click that link, your anti-spam solution can't really help you there any longer. And so you have to rely on a gateway product where that traffic um, you know, can be stopped if it's a known command and control server or if it's a part of a botnet or if it's part of a you know, um, malware URL site, et cetera, and stop that navigation from happening. Um, and that's how Secure Web Gateway can help you. And again, with Komodo, it's hosted in the cloud. So if, even if your user is just sitting at home and they got an email to their Gmail, right, it's not your corporate um, uh, email where it's not might, might not be protected. Maybe they got targeted to their personal email. Essentially, the clicking of a link or a payload, you still need that Secure Web Gateway to help you with that kind of attack. Okay. Yeah, I was going to jump in as well. I, you know, I completely agree with, with, with Gus, and we're we're getting a lot of feedback from from customers uh, that that have, you know, have anti-spam in place. And one of the things they're they're telling us as well is is uh, the you know that a lot of the attack emails today are legitimate. I mean, one of the biggest challenges right now is, is some of the um, some of the the, the social, more social engineering attacks that. You know, 
are delivering just a website link, and there it really is nothing wrong with the email itself, and it's very hard. You know, the the the, the email and spam protection really can't, uh, you know, aren't going to be effective at, at preventing because it's it's not the email that's the problem. It's it's the link. It's the service, and especially with uh, SaaS applications running on top of of different cloud providers, uh, you know, we've definitely seen th things of that nature where you know, web links to to say an AWS deployment. Well, that that by its nature isn't necessarily bad, but to Gus's point, it, it's it's the link itself, it's the and going to the website that that's the real real threat. Got it. Okay, well that um, that's a wrap for today. I really appreciate again Rob and Gus for taking time out today to talk to us about the threat landscape, what you're seeing, and what you're hearing from your clients, uh, Rob and Gus from Komodo Cybersecurity, the innovation and the technology that um, this company brings to the table. Um, I, I think today's session was great. The questions were great from the audience. Thank you. And again, this was recorded. It will be available on demand on the Komodo Cybersecurity Bright Talk channel. With that, we're going to end it for today. I appreciate everybody's time. Thanks, and have a great day.